Hi folks, Dr. Dicek. It is Erev Shabbos, Friday, September 4th, checking in on our continuing educational forum on COVID and other healthcare matters. Um, today I want to do just a, a quick summary of where we are in terms of therapeutics on September 4th, 2020, where we stand, uh, and with the exception of co convalescent plasma. We're talking about drugs right now and drug therapy. Um, remdesivir. Uh, remdesivir currently is only given in intravenous form to hospitalized patients. Uh, it is currently indicated and approved for individuals, and it was uh, primarily approved for individuals with oxygen saturations less than 94% on measurement. Uh, and it is used currently only in hospitalized patients. It's a five-day course currently. Uh, and uh, basically the studies have shown, the primary studies have shown, uh, that remdesivir was effective in decreasing the length of hospitalizations from about 18 to about 14 days in seriously sick COVID patients. Uh, unfortunately, there are shortages nationally right now, and not every COVID patient currently being admitted to the hospital is guaranteed to get remdesivir. Hopefully that will change this month. Uh, dexamethasone, uh, the steroid, a glucocorticosteroid, we spoke about this before. This is actually, to me, the most interesting of the group. Uh, because uh, it's currently used, again, only for hospitalized patients who are requiring oxygen. Uh, the dose is six milligrams. It's given once a day, and the course is 10 days of treatment. Uh, for those who uh, are in the ICU, uh, critically ill, there was a dramatic decrease in mortality from about 40, 41% uh, uh, mortality to about 29%. So that showed the most significant benefits, people who are on oxygen, who are in critical condition or serious condition. Uh, the second group that showed modest benefit, uh, a very small benefit, a difference of 23% mortality versus 26% mortality were individuals who were hospitalized but outside the ICU and individuals who weren't requiring oxygen therapy actually uh, didn't show any benefit at all. And in fact, in most of the studies showed uh, that they actually trended to do worse if they got uh, dexamethasone. So this is important to know that dexamethasone currently should never be given unless the person is showing significant hypoxia, meaning they're lacking oxygen. Uh, it should not be used in people who are at home who are not requiring supplemental oxygen. Those patients can do worse with dexamethasone. The up and coming drug right now under review is interferon beta 1b. You're gonna hear a lot about this in the near future. It's being used on hospitalized patients. It's still in the randomized controlled trial stage. Uh, phase three studies I believe are going on already with this drug. This is an inhale age, uh, inhaled agent. It's given by inhalation. Uh, although in the United Kingdom, they're currently doing trials of home treatment via inhalation with interferon beta 1b. Uh, according to the initial studies, the phase one and two studies, uh, the company that was studying this drug in the hospital that was studying it claimed a 79% uh, reduction of progression going on to intubation, meaning 79% of the patients who looked like they were going to end up needing a ventilator did not end up eating, needing a ventilator with the interferon beta 1b. That is the up and coming drug that we're looking at for hospitalized patients. Um, interleukin-6 inhibitors, we've spoken about them before, tocilizumab and cerulimab. Uh, unfortunately, the current data is very mixed. Overall, the trend is negative, meaning most centers are not pushing for IL-6 inhibitors right now. Uh, the reason is the most recent data shows if you look at overall all the studies, the trend is definitely on the negative side, meaning uh, it did not show any benefit and certainly didn't merit uh, being on the standard list of treatments right now for seriously sick COVID patients. Hydroxychloroquine, uh, that's the one that comes up very often, obviously, this is the most controversial of the outpatient and inpatient therapies. So I looked, um, basically looked at about eight trials. Uh, four of the trials were on hospitalized patients. Uh, certainly there was no change in the mortality uh, um, uh, of the patients who it was used on a hospitalized setting. That may not have been a fair assessment because it was used initially at the early stages in March, April, and May on critically ill patients who were already very sick, so there was very little hope. However, these four trials did include hospitalized patients who were not critically ill. There were considerable safety concerns in those four trials on hospitalized patients, 
mostly related to cardiac arrhythmias. Uh, outpatients, we studied, uh, we looked at two trials on the outpatient uh, studies. Again, no major changes in severity by day 14 in individuals who were studied on an outpatient basis. Uh, and there was no uh, change in the overall clinical status by change 15, uh, day 15. So uh, the outpatient trials certainly were not overwhelming. Uh, prophylaxis, remember President Trump at some point claimed that he took the medication uh, prophylactically when exposed to one of his aides who had COVID. Uh, so they had two trials that were looked at for prophylaxis. In fact, I think they looked at it even for healthcare workers and there was no change in the incidence of new illness PCR positive for individuals who took hydroxy when they were exposed to somebody closely uh, with COVID. So unfortunately for hydroxychloroquine, I think what you'll find in the scientific community is overall the trend is not to use hydroxychloroquine currently. I certainly was an advocate for hydroxychloroquine at the outset when we had no options during the month of March and April. However, I have not used it since, and many, most of the colleagues that I deal with are not recommending hydroxychloroquine currently, and overall I would say the scientific data is trending negative on hydroxychloroquine. Uh, where are we going in the outpatient treatments? I want to talk about that for a minute. Remdesivir, remember remdesivir, which is currently given in inpatients and in intravenous forms, uh, there's currently a a new trial which is starting up giving inhaled remdesivir uh, in hospitalized in outpatients I'm sorry people who aren't yet hospitalized so that is one of the new up-and-comers uh, two drugs uh, which are oral antiviral agents favipavir uh, and uh, EIDD 28801 uh, uh, that's the experimental name those are both oral RNA polymerase inhibitors, those are oral antiviral agents, uh, and those are actually, um, uh, have similar uh, benefits or similar mechanisms to remdesivir and how they affect the immune system. Uh, they're direct antiviral agents, and both of these are being given orally. The favipavir is still under study, and the EIDD2801 uh, uh, oral um, RNA pro polymerase, inhibitor, polymerase inhibitor is currently under early study as well. Those are the up-and-comers in the oral antiviral areas. Uh, I am actually heading up with Dr. Joseph Conigliaro, who was one of the uh, major primary investigators on the oral pep, on the intravenous pepsid or intravenous famotidine studies that took place at Northwell. Uh, that had such benefits with hospitalized patients uh, getting them off ventilators or keeping some of them off ventilators. So Dr. Canigliaro and I are actually now the co-primary investigators uh, in conjunction with the University of Florida, and we are starting up in the next few weeks the oral famotidine outpatient or oral pepsid outpatient trials. Uh, for those of you, um, anybody you know who gets sick with COVID, who is an outpatient, uh, you can contact me or Dr. Canigliaro. We have a nurse practitioner who's going to be enrolling patients. It will be a randomized trial, uh, meaning uh, you may or may not get the drug. Uh, but famotidine is definitely on the up and coming list of good possibilities for outpatient treatment. And the last one I'm going to talk about is the Lilly product, the monoclonal antibody, uh, which is an NIH funded study. As you all know, I've spoken about it during recent COVID outbreak in the last few weeks. I've referred patients to the Mount Sinai monoclonal antibody study for individuals who are symptomatic with COVID, uh, especially high-risk patients. And those patients, 50% of them, uh, or uh, I'm sorry, 50% uh, uh, are being randomized to monoclonal antibodies, which is proving to be a very effective treatment for outpatient treatment for COVID patients. Uh, on the reinfection front, some good news. You know, I want people to understand when, when we raised, when I raised the issue of reinfection two months ago, uh, many people got scared, got worried, not physicians, but uh, mainly patients that there was some fear of reinfection. Today, it's universally agreed, I believe, that uh, everybody is seeing at least anecdotal reinfection. There are now multiple uh, case reports, for, as we spoke about, from Nevada, from Hong Kong, from Asia, and from areas throughout the United States where we've shown genetically proven reinfections. The good news is it appears that most, the vast majority of people who are getting reinfected are only mildly sick, which is very good news 
but they are equally infectious. They can pass on the infection apparently, just as they did when they had the, first, the infection the first time around. So it's very important information and good news for the vaccine studies actually, because what it's showing us is that people who were previously infected uh, have what we call protective immunity, which means that if they get it a second time around, they may not be as sick. That is called protective immunity. When, a, when somebody gets an infection, let's say you get measles or whooping cough, uh, for the rest of your life, you pretty much, unless you go through chemotherapy or some dramatic immune compromise, for the rest of your life, you'll have what's called sterilizing immunity, which means that if you're exposed to measles or whooping cough again, you won't get it. In the case of COVID, unfortunately, we couldn't get sterilizing immunity from having COVID one time, but we do apparently get some protective immunity, which means if we get COVID a second time, we're probably not going to be as sick. And that's great news on the vaccine front, because that's how a vaccine works. A vaccine gives you exposure to the virus, uh, you form an immune response, and the next time you get exposed to that virus, you will produce robust antibodies to protect you. So even if you do get the virus, you won't get as sick. It's a great model for vaccine. It's great news for the vaccine studies. And I'm excited about the fact that the reinfections are showing such promise in terms of not being horribly sick, at least in the majority of cases. There may be some small number of people who do get more sick the second time around, but I have not seen that, although I did hear of one individual in the five towns who suspected to have a reinfection who is more sick than he was the first time around. Uh, in closing, we're going to talk more next week on the vaccine safety issues. Uh, I want to debunk uh, next week all of the craziness that's going on. The anti-vax world is uh, putting out a huge amount of misinformation all over the place right now. Uh, it's absolutely bizarre. Every uh, Everybody who's involved in vaccine development will tell you not only is the FDA being very diligent, but there are bodies within the FDA, CBER, C-B-E-R, which is the Center for Biological uh, Evaluation and Research. They're called CBER. Those are very sophisticated researchers who study the safety of all biological agents that come through the FDA approval process. In addition, there are independent safety and data monitoring boards that are involved with every FDA project, but specifically with COVID research. So um, there are no secrets about the safety of this vaccine, and there won't be by the time the phase three studies are finished. Uh, once these studies are finished, I think we'll be able to safely tell people this is a safe vaccine. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to tell them if it's an effective vaccine, uh, and we'll know that within the next few months. But it's all good news on the vaccine front so far, and I think we should uh, uh, celebrate that. I want to wish everybody a good job as we got in a lot of information today. I hope it's helpful to you and uh, hope to see you again uh, over the weekend and uh, wish everybody well. Take care.